Thank you, uh, Chairman Lee and Vice Chair Maloney and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, let me start by saying that my colleagues and I strongly support the goals of maximum employment and price stability that Congress has set for monetary policy. We are committed to providing clear explanations about our policies and our actions. Congress has given us an important degree of independence so that we can effectively pursue our statutory goals based on facts and objective analysis. We appreciate that our independence brings with it an obligation for transparency and accountability. Today I will discuss the outlook for the economy and for monetary policy. The U.S. economy is now in the 11th year of this expansion and the baseline outlook remains favorable. Gross domestic product, or GDP, increased at an annual pace of 1.9% in the third quarter of this year after rising at around a 2.5% rate last year and in the first half of this year. The moderate third quarter reading is partly due to the transitory effect of the UAW strike at General Motors. But it also reflects weakness in business investment, which is being restrained by sluggish growth abroad and by trade developments. These factors have also weighed on exports and manufacturing this year. In contrast, household consumption has continued to rise solidly, supported by a healthy job market, rising incomes, and favorable levels of consumer confidence. And reflecting the decline in mortgage rates since late 2018, residential investment turned up in the third quarter following an extended period of weakness. The unemployment rate was 3.6% in October, near a half-century low. The pace of job gains has eased this year, but remains solid. We had expected some slowing after last year's strong pace. At the same time, participation in the labor force by people in their prime working years has been increasing. Ample job opportunities appear to have encouraged many people to join the workforce and others to remain in it. This is a very welcome development. The improvement in the jobs market in recent years has benefited a wide range of individuals and communities. Indeed, recent wage gains have been strongest for lower paid workers. People who live and work in low and middle income communities tell us, many, many of them at these Fed Listens events that the chair and vice chair referred to, <clears throat> tell us that many who have struggled to find work are now getting opportunities to add new and better cha uh, chapters to their lives. Significant differences, however, persist across different groups of workers in different areas of the country. Unemployment rates for African Americans and Hispanics are still well above the jobless rates for whites and Asians, and the proportion of people with a job is lower in rural communities. Inflation continues to run below the FOMC's symmetric 2% objective. The total price index for personal consumption expenditures increased 1.3% over the 12 months ending in September, held down by declines in energy prices. Core PCE inflation, which excludes food and energy prices and tends to be a better indicator of future inflation, was 1.7% over the same period. Looking ahead, my colleagues and I see a sustained expansion of economic activity, a strong labor market, and inflation near our symmetric 2% objective as most likely. This favorable baseline partly reflects the policy adjustments that we have made to provide support for the economy. However, noteworthy risks to this outlook remain. In particular, sluggish growth abroad and trade developments have weighed on the economy and pose ongoing risks. Moreover, inflation pressures remain muted, and indicators of longer-term inflation expectations are at the lower end of their historical range. Persistent below-target inflation could lead to an unwelcome downward slide in longer-term inflation expectations. We will continue to monitor these developments and assess their implications for U.S. economic activity and inflation. We also continue to monitor the risks to the financial system. Over the past year, the overall set level of vulnerabilities facing the financial system has remained at a moderate level. Overall, investor appetite for risk appears to be within a normal range, although it is elevated in some asset classes. Debt loads of businesses are historically high, but the ratio of household borrowing to income is low relative to its pre-crisis level and has been gradually declining in recent years. The core of the financial sector appears resilient, with leverage low and funding risk limited relative to the levels of recent decades. 
At the end of this week, we will be releasing our third financial stability report, which shares our detailed assessment of the resilience of the U.S. financial system. Turning to monetary policy. Over the past year, weakness in global growth, trade developments, and muted inflation pressures have prompted the FOMC to adjust its assessment of the appropriate path of interest rates. Since July, the committee has lowered the target range for the federal funds rate by three quarters of a percentage point. These policy adjustments put the current target range at one and a half to one and three quarters percent. The committee took these actions to help the U.S. economy keep the U.S. economy strong and inflation near our two percent objective and to provide some insurance against ongoing risks. As monetary policy operates with a lag, the full effects of these adjustments on economic growth, the job market, and inflation will be realized over time. We see the current stance of monetary policy as likely to remain appropriate as long as incoming information about the economy remains broadly consistent with our outlook of moderate growth, a strong labor market, and inflation near our symmetric 2% objective. We'll be monitoring the effects of our policy actions along with other information bearing on the outlook as we assess the appropriate path of the target range for the funds rate. Of course, if developments emerge that cause a material reassessment of our outlook, we would respond accordingly. Policy is not on a preset course. The FOMC is committed to ensuring that its policy framework remains well positioned to meet its statutory goals. We believe our existing framework has served us well. Nonetheless, the current low interest rate environment may limit the ability of monetary policy to support the economy. We are currently conducting a public review of our monetary policy strategy, tools, and communications, the first of its kind for the Fed. With the U.S. economy operating close to maximum employment and price stability, now is an especially opportune time to conduct such a review. Through our Fed Listens events, we've been hearing a diverse range of perspectives, not only from academic experts, but also from representatives of consumer, labor, business, community, and other groups. We will draw on these insights as we assess how best to achieve and maintain maximum employment and price stability. <clears throat> we'll continue to report on our discussions in the minutes of our meetings and share our conclusions when we finish the review, likely around the middle of next year. <clears throat> In a downturn, <clears throat> it would also be important for fiscal policy to support the economy. However, as noted in the Congressional Budget Office's recent long-term budget outlook, the federal budget is on an unsustainable path with high and rising debt. Over time, this outlook could restrain fiscal policymakers' willingness or ability to support economic activity during a downturn. In addition, I remain concerned that the high and rising federal debt can, in the longer term, restrain private investment and thereby reduce productivity and overall growth. Putting the federal budget on, an unsustainable, on a sustainable path would aid the long-term vigor of the U.S. economy and help ensure that policymakers have the space to use fiscal policy to assist in stabilizing the economy if it weakens. <clears throat> I'll conclude with a few words on the technical implementation of monetary policy. In January, the FOMC made the key decision to continue to implement monetary policy in what we call an ample reserves regime. In such a regime, we will continue to control the federal funds rate primarily by setting our administered rates and not through frequent, frequent interventions to actively manage the supply of reserves. In the transition to the efficient and effective level of reserves in this regime, we slowed the gradual decline in our balance sheet in May and we stopped it in July. In response to the funding pressures in money markets that emerged in mid-September, we decided to maintain a level of reserves at or above the level that prevailed in early September. To achieve this level of reserves, we announced in mid-October that we would purchase Treasury bills at least into the second quarter of next year and would continue temporary open market operations at least through January. These actions are purely technical measures to support the effective implementation of monetary policy as we continue to learn about the appropriate level of reserves. They do not represent a change in the stance of monetary policy. Thank you. I will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. The chair chairman, along with other senators, <coughs> is voting. And uh, because the Fed chair needs to leave at 1230 at a hard stop, uh, he is suggesting that we limit our, 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 our questions to four minutes so that everyone gets a chance to question. So I will start and then go to uh, Representative Marshant and, until the, uh, the chairman comes back. Uh, so thank you. The, the full unemployment rate um, 
is well below the Fed's long-run estimate of 4.2 percent. Measures of underemployment and long-term unemployment also are at a near decade low. Yet the unemployment rate for some groups is substantially higher. For example, the uh, black unemployment rate, while at an historic low, is still well above 5 percent. Is the economy at full employment, or could a tighter labor market draw more people back into the workforce? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're charged to achieve maximum employment. And when we think about maximum employment, we look at not just unemployment, but also labor force participation. We look at wages. We look at, you know, many, many data points. And I would say that um, what we have learned and what will we continue to learn is that the U.S. economy can operate at a much lower level of unemployment than many would have thought. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not surprising that we'd be learning that now because we're at levels of unemployment that we haven't seen in 50 years. For, this is the first time that we've had unemployment meaningfully below 4% for 18 months. So we are, we're observing this and we're seeing, as you point out, mm -hmm. that inflation is actually kind of moving sideways and wages are moving at a healthy clip, but they're not moving up in a way that would be that would suggest that there are upward price pressures. So um, I, I think we're very open to the idea. I'm very open to the idea that we don't know where maximum employment precisely is. We have to have significant humility when we make estimates of that. And we've got to let the data speak to us. And with the data, are, the, mm -hmm. the data are not sending any signal that the labor market is so hot or that inflation is moving up or anything like that. So I think um, what we've learned is that the current level of unemployment is consistent with, with a strong labor market, um, but it is not one that is, that is uh, in any way presenting difficulties. And it has many beneficial side effects, including pulling people back into the labor market, including wages moving up for people at the, at the lower end of the wage spectrum. So there's a lot to like about today's labor market, and we'd like to see it continue strong, and we're using our tools to try to make that happen. Uh, as you noted, the economy has added uh, jobs for 109 consecutive months. Uh, unemployment is well below 4 percent. However, the annual wage growth is just 3 percent. And why is wage growth still below what we would expect with the strong labor market? Um, we might have expected wages to move up more this late in, in, a, in a lengthy, lengthy ongoing expansion, um, particularly with very low unemployment. Uh, and there, there are a number of possible explanations for why that hasn't happened. One is just that productivity has been lower. So wages should ultimately equal inflation pr plus productivity. And that's right about where we are. We have 3% wage growth. That, that accounts for about 2% 2 2 inflation and around 1% uh, Wage growth, but um, but there are other there are other possibilities. One is just that there's still slack in the labor market. That that can be part of the answer. Um, we don't know with any preci precision. It also may be that the neutral rate of interest is lower than we've been thinking, and that therefore our policy is less accommodative than we have been thinking. So I think we're we're letting the data speak to us and uh, um, you know carefully monitoring the situation and, and trying to get answers to that question. Some have said it's the increased concentration in different industries is giving uh, employers unprecedented power in keeping wages down. Is that so? I, I think the, I think there are a number of other sort of institutional possible explanations and trend explanations. You, you could point to automation. You could point to globalization. You could point to concentration among uh, mm -hmm. industries where over time U.S. industries have tended to get more concentrated as the, as the economy has matured. You could also point to lower unionization. So any of those, any of those factors can well be playing, and probably all are playing some, some role in, in, this, uh, in this, what is a bit of a puzzle, why, why uh, we haven't seen more of an uptick in wages. My, my time has expired. Uh, Representative Mershon for, for four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you for being here today, Chairman Powell. I would like to focus my uh, questions today uh, <clears throat> primarily on preparing for the next downturn, whether it be three years from now, five years from now, whenever it comes. Historically speaking, is the, is the uh, Federal Reserve positioned as well as it has been positioned 
in past recessions when the Federal Reserve was the primary um, go-to agency where uh, the federal government said, you know, we need help from you to to stimulate the economy. Are we positioned there or are we out of position? Well, um, if you look at post-war, typical post-war recessions where the, what the Fed has done is it's cut interest rates. <clears throat> And on average, those, those, the amount of those cuts has been 5% or so. Right. So with the federal funds rate having peaked at about 2.4% and now being at about yeah. a little above 1.5%, we don't have that kind of room. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Just if you look at the longer-term interest rates, which are not directly affected much by our policy, they've just been declining for 40 years now. <clears throat> and that is because of inflation being lower and under control and less volatile. And also just the aging demographics means higher saving, means more savings relative to investment, and that puts downward pressure on interest rates. So I think the new normal now is lower interest rates, lower inflation, probably lower growth. And you're seeing that all over the world, not just in the United States. You're seeing it to a much greater extent in many parts of the world than we're, we're seeing it here. So knowing that, <clears throat> that is one of the main reasons we have really the basic reason why we are having this public review of our monetary policy framework to see if there are ways we can um, alter our, our strategies, our tools, and our communications in ways that would make us more effective in this world where we're, where we're too close, closer than we would like to zero when we kind of run out of options. So uh, that's one thing. Fiscal policy <clears throat> will also be important, though. I mean, I think from the standpoint of monetary policy, we're, we're looking hard at ways to make sure that we, that we can use our tools even after rates go to zero. Ultimately, fiscal policy has been a key part of the counter-cyclical reaction as well, though. And uh, next question, the uh, disruption in the re repo market that took place in September, <clears throat> anticipated, not anticipated, um, do you anticipate keeping uh, the expansion at, at the level it is until you're sure that won't happen again? Well, so anticipated or not, um, it's a different world post-crisis, and really because of all the, the expansion in our balance sheet and, and what, essentially what we've done now is we've now required financial institutions to, to have a lot more liquidity on their balance sheets so that the Fed doesn't have to run in and, and uh, with, with our own liquidity. So that's, and that's, a, I think, a big benefit to the financial system. But a lot of that liquidity is held in our reserves. We used to manage uh, the interest rate by, by keeping reserves scarce, and we had a total of $20 billion. Right now, we have in excess of 1.5 trillion in reserves, and so that means that we're <clears throat> we're trying to find that level as we allowed the balance sheet to shrink, where reserves would become scarce, and there was really no way to know. I think the data that we had suggested that we were not close to that point until September. I think um, we're still very much looking at what happened in September, but I think we learned in September that we needed to pour, to make sure that reserves didn't go under that level that we were at in mid-September, which is a little bit shy of one and a half trillion. So that's really what we're, what we're doing. It's, it's technical. I think we have it under control. We're prepared to continue to learn and adjust as we do this, but it's a, it's a process. I would say it, it's one that doesn't really have any implications for the economy or for the general public, though. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative Beattie for four minutes. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair, and to the Chair, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for being here. Uh, we have four minutes. I've got three questions I want to try to get through, one on the CRA, uh, one on venture capital, and one on climate change. Uh, the, the first one on the CRA, as we've talked about, is very important to me. I know recently that the Feds and the Office of the Comptroller <coughs> Currency and the FDIC have all been working on a proposal to revamp that 1977 CRA Act. It, it is my understanding that they wanted to do a joint, but we're not sure if one of the agencies would go alone. CRA is very important to me and to my third congressional district in Ohio, like across the nation, because of the resources it puts back into communities. And more importantly, minorities' communities tend to, to benefit. Do you have any insight on knowing where they are or if they're working together and we'll be able to meet that end-of-the-year goal? 
So we, we strongly submit the mission of support the mission of CRA, which is to assure credit availability in in the in the areas of that banks serve, particularly low and moderate income communities. We think it's a good time to modernize given technological developments and all kinds of other developments. We've been working very, very hard with the other two bank agencies to try to find common ground. And, you know, we're committed to making sure this reform uh, actually makes puts us in a better place to serve the intended beneficiaries of CRA. We haven't quite gotten there yet. My, we're going to keep trying, though, and, and my hope is that we will ultimately be able to come together with a common answer, which I think would be better for, for everyone if we can do that. Okay. My next question is, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco recently held a conference entitled The Economics of Climate Change, and I believe this was the first ever uh, <coughs> conference by the feds on climate change in the economy. Can you discuss how the Federal Reserve views the impact of climate change on our economy and, mon and monetary policy and how the feds views have evolved over time? So I guess I would say climate change is an important issue, but, but not principally for, in, for, for the Fed. It's, not, it's really an issue that's, can, that's assigned to lots of other government agencies, not so much to the Fed. Nonetheless, um, uh, over time, it can, it can affect, uh, affect us in some ways, which I'll mention. One just is that we require financial institutions and financial market utilities you know, the large utilities that are so fundamental to the financial system, we require them to be resilient against all kinds of things, including severe weather. There's a link between severe weather and climate change. So in a sense, we're already, um, to the extent severe weather is becoming more common, we're already incorporating that into our supervision. And we'll have to think ahead. We're doing a lot of research in this area to think ahead about sort of from a risk management perspective. Our perspective is not, we're, we're not going to be the ones who decide society's response Sorry. to, that's going to be elected legislatures, not, not us. Uh, in terms of monetary policy, it doesn't have any near-term implication for monetary policy. Over time, climate change could have effects, but it's not something that we'd be considering. Okay. Now. And only because of my time, my last question is, there was a 2018 report by Price Waterhouse that found that 80% of the venture capital investments went to just four states, California, New York, Massachusetts, and Texas. I'm from the great state of Ohio. And so I guess my question is, startups throughout the rest of the country, especially the Midwest are overlooked. Are there any thoughts uh, on the fact that an overwhelming majority of the venture capital is going to four states? What effect is this having on the regions like the Midwest? Um, I'd have to look at that study. I, I, I think, um, you know, a, a company that's in San Francisco can invest in a company that's in Ohio, though. So I would hope that, 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 that they're not just investing in companies in San Francisco, but um, so we should maybe look at some partnerships and uh, how that works. I, I do think, you know, look, many of the successful companies in which venture capital firms invest are not located in those areas. That some of them are, but some are located anywhere in the country, really, where they're entrepreneurs. Okay. Thank you. Um, Representative Swikert, four minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Vice Chairman. Um, Chairman Powell, um, can I ask, I'm going to, more of a global question. If you look at much of the data um, from the Fed, from the BLS, from others, our society is actually in, um, in many ways, a sweet spot. Um, a, do you agree with that? B, what do we do policy-wise to stay there? And for those of us up here, how do we not screw it up? <laughs> and then how do we actually bias it towards the positive? What would you do? So, in, in, um, as I mentioned, 50-year low in unemployment, inflation low and uh, under control, labor force participation ticking up, consumer confidence high. The outlook is good. I think households generally are focused on, according to the surveys, are focused on this healthy job market and wages going up. So it's, it's actually a very good place from that standpoint. That's not to say that every community has benefited. We know, that's, we know that that's not the case. Um, how do we keep it there? So we, the key to this, given the risks, the risks that we see are slowing global growth and particularly weaker manufacturing, and that affects U.S. manufacturing. So the, the key to, to keeping this going and, and to it continuing 
are that uh, we keep job creation at a solid level, that households retain their confidence, that wages keep moving up. That seems to be the engine that's driving the U.S. economy forward at this time. But I'm, I'm going to I want to go longer term with with an answer. I mean, the U.S. faces longer term issues that really need your attention around labor force participation and productivity. Those, and, those and, are the two and, things that we really, where we, we, you know, in labor force participation, we lag most other advanced economies. And that's something we can do something about that really the Fed can't do much about it. So it's about, it's more about fiscal policy. It's that support attachment to the labor force. So, so much of the policy that we all engage in here could be pushing up labor force participation. We're right now, what, about 63.3? That's which, right. Yeah. Which for some of our models of testimony we had as a committee a couple of years ago, we didn't think we'd get that far. But you, we've demonstrated that there is slack out there. Um, could you touch on what we could do in that demographic um, headwind that is um, where we are in the United States to also encourage that labor force participation. Um, incentives for someone that's older to stay in the uh, labor force, getting yeah. millennial males to actually start to equal millennial females in, tie, in the labor force. Well, I think what there, would you do? There, there's a range of policies, and, and they would appeal, I think, across the political spectrum. Some of them are about labor demand, some are about labor supply, and I, I think many of them would work. That's the great thing. Is, and I think for, for, you know, for young males, it's going to be addressing the opioid problem. It's going to be skills and training and uh, internships. We had a great meeting with a bunch of uh, experts on internship products uh, programs recently. I think you're seeing older people stay in the labor force more and more. Their, their participation is moving up. Um, but you also see, I mean, I think there, there are lots of programs which are pulling people, for example, women who've been out of the labor force back in after their kids are grown up. You see, you see that happening uh, as places as well. So I, I think there are just so many things that, that can be done. And we, again, we lag just about every other wealthy country in the world in labor force participation for prime age workers. This is not where we should be, and I think there are things we can do about it. In my last 20 some seconds, um, slight non sequitur. Okay, with the dual mandate, how often in your conversations with your economists do you get into the discussion of currency differentials and the headwinds that actually creates both in export and capital coming into the country? Um, you know, uh, where are we currency-wise in your conversations? So, you know, exchange rates are, are one financial condition among many, and it happens to be one that is assigned to the Treasury Department for Management. So they, the Treasury has full responsibility for, for exchange rate policy. We don't. It's just another, it's in all economic models when we change policy. So it's just a model input? It's just a model input. It's, it's in no way is it a principal driver of, our, of the way we think about policy or the way other central banks do. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, Madam Vice Chair, thank you. Thank you. For four minutes, Lois Franklin. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here, Mr. Powell. I, I want to uh, read you something that's just been recently posted by the National Women's Law Center and get your comment on it. I have a couple questions related to this. So we, we've all heard about the gender wage gap. Women, on the average, make only 82 cents to average a man's dollar. It's much worse for women of color. Uh, but there are two sides to a family's budget, the income that comes in and the expenses they pay out. And new research is finding that in addition to the wage gap, there is rising inequality on how quickly prices are rising for families struggling the most in the economy. This concept known as inflation inequality means the kinds of products disproportionately consumed by richer households, think organic produce and name brand drugs rose in price at a slower rate than the kinds of products consumed by low and moderate income households. Uh, and a just re released research by Columbia Uni University begins to quantify these impacts by updating poverty rates for an adjusted inflation index that accounts for inflation inequality. And the article goes on to suggest that an appropriate course of action would be to pe peg the federal poverty a threshold to a higher rate of inflation given how many more people would be considered in poverty when looking at the expense size of the ledger. I would just ask you whether or not any of this enters into any of your decision making, whether you have any research on this or any comment on this. It's an interesting, so I did see that research um, which showed that 
So different groups of people buy different baskets of goods, and in principle, inflation can be higher or lower. This was a piece of research that showed that the basket of goods that are bought by people at the lower end of the income spectrum has experienced higher inflation over time. So, and that the implication of that would be that their real incomes are even lower than we think. Um, so I'd like to see a lot more research on that. That's, that's an interesting recent paper that's getting a lot of attention right now. Um, there is a, uh, there's no definitive answer. There's another, there's a series that I guess uh, the government currently conducts for, for consumer price inflation that looks at a, a basic basket of goods that finds a much smaller difference. Nonetheless, it's an important issue that needs further research. Is that something that you would be doing or you think somebody else should be doing that research? Well, the, we, our researchers would would do it, but you would you would tend to see, um, you know, the the agency whoever does CPI is it the um, Bureau of Economic Analysis, I guess does, uh, I think does CPI, and they would do that. We have researchers who do research on inflation all the time. I'm not sure whether the um, the, the the piece you I don't think the piece you mentioned it was a Fed piece, but we have researchers who research. It was at Columbia University. Yeah, yeah, but they were co-authors. There were several co-authors. And I wanted to ask you uh, 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 another subject. C could you explain the relationship of uh, the, uh, our immigration policy to employment rate in the economy? Sure. So first, we don't have responsibility for immigration policy. We don't comment on it. We don't advise uh, anybody on immigration policy. It's completely not our role. But I, so, but it, it does kind of connect to our our role in in um, uh, you know in analyzing the economy. So you can think of uh, the economy's ability to grow as consisting of two things. One is how fast is the labor force growing? And secondly, is how much is output per hour growing? That's what growth is, consists of, really just those two things. In the United States, the, the, the trend growth of our labor force has been very slow. It was 2.5% in the 1960s. Now it's about a half a percent, and about half of that is immigration. So immigration is a, is a key input into our longer-term growth rate. And I, I would say if you, if you, if you look to, to population growth as a way to support higher growth for the United States, then, then immigration would need to be in your thinking. But again, something we don't comment too much on. Thank you. I, I yield back. Well, thank you. Uh, Representative Trone. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Please. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you uh, for being here today very much. Um, I had some questions also on uh, labor market okay. participation, and I think you've addressed those, and also on immigration, how that could help us improve, increase our labor pool. But I was thinking about the status of across the country now. We've got over 30 states have put in <clears throat> minimum wage laws from $13 to $16, and there's something business is affected with everywhere. How do you see that's going to address the situation on the mismatch between labor scarcity and yet this very low wage growth that we see? And how does that tie into inflation? Well, um, we don't take a position on, on um, minimum wage. It's really an issue you have to balance. There are two things to balance. And I, if I were you, I'd look at a broad range of research. It com the research comes to different perspectives. But in essentially all the research you see, when the minimum wage is raised a significant amount, you'll see some job loss and you'll see some wage gains. And I, I would look at a range of that research and I would try to think what the right policy is. That's how I would do it. In terms of inflation, it doesn't really play much into it. First of all, our mandate is price inflation, not wage inflation. We don't see wages moving up um, uh, in, in any kind of uh, way that suggests that, that, it would, that they would put unwelcome, up, unwelcome upward pressure on prices. So I don't really think it, it is an important part of the inflation discussion right now. And trying to translate this uh, labor scarcity that we have into higher wages for the American workers, from 2012 to 2016, we had about $120 increase per month in average wages. And then in 2016 to current, that's been cut in half, about $56 a month. And yet, this is in the time of the lowest inflation, as you said, in 50 years, these last 18 months. So what is that mismatch between wage growth and lower unemployment mean to our economy? Well, I, so 
We, we look at uh, a, a wide range of wage and compensation measures, and what they tend to show is if you go back five years, wages and compensation were going up about 2 percent. That has gradually moved up to about 3 percent. And so that's really the trend has been upward. And, that, and that's consistent with the thought that a tighter labor market, lower unemployment, um, uh, and surveys that suggest the labor market is tight. Uh, it, it is consistent with that. But we've seen wages moving up. We, we look and we look at a, I can tell you the principal ones we look at, but that's, I think that's true across all major measures of wages um, over the last, let's say, five, six years. But why do you think they've slowed so dramatically the last two years? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think uh, it's hard to say. W wage, I think average, wa average hour hourly earnings is, is an important one, at, which peaked at 3.4 percent uh, earlier this year or at the end of last year and has, has been sort of trickling down. It's right at 3 percent now, so it's a fairly modest one. I, I, I'm not at all sure why that is. It may be compositional effects. Some, some argue that as older workers retire, younger workers come in and they, they have a lower. But in any case, you know, it's consistent with this, with this idea that we're not seeing excessive tightness in the labor market that's generating outsized wage gains. We're seeing kind of nice wage gains given inflation and productivity, but nothing that's at all uh, out of line with that. Thank you. Chairman Powell, um, we're borrowing as a country, uh, as a government more than ever, with debt held by the public expected to reach 95 percent of gross domestic product within the next 10 years. And yet we're also paying interest on that debt at an all-time historic low with a 30-year uh, borrowing cost of just 2.4 percent. What's the reason for this, uh, I guess some would say, fortunate fiscal reprieve a a at a time when Congress as an institution has shown really no sign of fiscal discipline at all. So wh where does it come from? Well, it, it really is a long-term trend. If, For example, if you were to look at a graph of what the 10-year what the Treasury yielded, if you went back 40 years, what you would see is a ski slope down. And there, it's all the way down to today. It's been, this is a long-term trend. <clears throat> By the way, it's true all around the globe. Now, why is that happening? I, I think it's, first of all, it's, it's inflation Market getting under control, <clears throat> becoming less volatile. <clears throat> and ultimately continuing to decline to the point where Market the risk of lower inflation is actually greater than the risk of higher inflation at the moment. That's part of it. It's also just aging demographics. So uh, as people get into their later years, they save more. That creates more savings and per dollar of investment, and that tends to drive interest rates down. And I don't know that that, um, that, that, that trend shows no signs of, of reversing or, or, or anything like that. So that's, that's really what's going on with these longer rates. Uh, some have suggested that because uh, uh, we in the United States, uh, that the United States government <clears throat> borrows uh, in its, its own currency, it's, uh, this level of spending isn't a problem because the Fed can just monetize the debt and keep doing so more or less indefinitely. But what's your reaction to that talk? Are there risks inherent in it? Yes, no, I, and I, as I mentioned in my in my testimony, um, the fact that interest rates are lower does mean that we will pay less in, in interest. It does not mean that we can ignore deficits at all. Uh, we're we're going to have to get on a sustainable path. What what does that mean? So, um, the debt is growing faster than the economy. It's as simple as that, in nominal terms, and uh, that is by definition unsustainable. Ultimately, you will have to get it to to where the debt is not growing faster than the economy, and it's growing faster in the United States by a, by a pretty significant margin. So even with lower rates and even with decent growth, <clears throat> there's still going to be a need to reduce these deficits. And, and, and I would say, by the way, that's a, that's a need over time. You know, I'm, We're not in the business of advising you when to do that or how to do it, but it is inevitable that over time we will have to do it. And, and you know, frankly, if we don't do it, what happens is We'll, our children will wind up spending their tax dollars more on interest than, than the things they really need, like education, security, health. In the past, you've mentioned uncertainties in the area of international trade as imposing something of an economic headwind for us. What, um, after we've had over the last couple of years uh, a lot of trade measures going into effect, what has the Fed learned about the interaction between trade and monetary policy? 
So first, the first thing I need to say is we should never be heard to be commenting on, on trade policy. It's not our job. We try to stay in our lane, but our lane is the economy. But we, we don't have any view at all, and we wouldn't express one on trade policy itself. Our lane is the economy. So in, in principle, anything that affects our ability to achieve our mandated goals is an inappropriate subject for monetary policy. So we've been hearing now for a year and a half from companies, and I think this is fairly widely accepted now, that tariffs, but to an even greater extent, uncertainty around future trade policy is for now. Uh, it has been weighing on business sentiment and is probably part of the global slowdown in manufacturing, in business investment, in exports, in trade part of the story. There's a much bigger story out there, but it's a part of that. I see my time's expired. Senator Klobuchar. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for being here today. Some of the issues that I was going to raise have been uh, discussed, uh, the challenges ahead with our economy, including the uh, deficit, which I will note was uh, greatly exacerbated by the last tax bill. Um, and as well as problems in some sectors such as agriculture, which is very important uh, to us in the Midwest. But I wanted to focus on a third issue I have, which is income inequality and um, even if people have jobs, um, it's often hard for them to afford things. And then you have uh, the added problems and strains. Um, Washington Post reported this year in September that income inequality in America uh, is the highest it's been since the Census Bureau started tracking it more than five decades ago. Uh, the top 1% have experienced income growth of um, over 200% uh, in the last decades. Um, and between 2007 and 2016, the median wealth of lower income families fell by 42%. Um, in your opinion, will widening inequality lead to lower growth expectations over the long term? And what should we be doing about this? Um, so I guess I would start by saying that <clears throat> I think um, we probably <clears throat> would all agree that prosperity should be as widely shared as possible. And so I would just point to two aspects of the, of the broader problem that, that I, I think are important and need attention. The first is just the relative stagnation, relative stagnation of of incomes below the, the, the fairly high part of the distribution. And that's even after allowing for taxes and benefits and things like that. That's, that's one thing where we, we want to see incomes moving up broadly across the income spectrum. The second <clears throat> is, is mobility. I think you want to see people moving um, from the bottom to the top and, and vice versa, by the way. Uh, it has to happen just as a matter of arithmetic. Uh, somebody, uh, so, for example, the bottom 20 percent, what are the chances that if you're born in the bottom 20 percent of income or wealth, you'll make it to the middle 20 percent or the top 20 percent? Mm -hmm. The United States actually lags most other wealthy countries in that measure now. This is very much not our self-image as a country. and. Those are things we need to address. Um, so I think those oh, are important. Mm -hmm. that, that's one. Um, and I think increasing the minimum wage, I have my own views on this, um, would be helpful. But as you talk about that, one of the, our challenges right now is uh, hooking up our education system uh, with the jobs that are available right now and making sure everyone has access to those jobs. And I don't think it always means a four-year degree. Um, some of the fastest growing job areas are one and two-year degrees. I think we're going to have 64,000 or 74,000 openings for electricians. Um, and one of the things I'm really focused on is apprenticeships and um, trying to make it easier for people to access those kinds of degrees. Could you briefly talk about that? I, I, uh, we just met last week with six people who run apprenticeship programs and funding of apprenticeship programs around the country in our boardroom. And I have to tell you, it's, it's very, very impressive what they can do. They're, they're focusing on low and moderate income communities. They're um, getting them in high schools and out of high schools and matching them up with employers who need those people. They're getting good jobs. It's really working. And the thing that limits the, their ability to do this on a much wider scale is funding. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's very impressive so, what they can do. I think do. a lot of this is how we use our resources for education <clears throat> and matching that up. Um, I'll ask you um, in writing a question on retirement. I just think it's becoming such a challenge in our new economy. Um, with um, and Senator Coons and I have a bill to address that um, called ups with up savings accounts, which I think is a great idea for small and medium businesses. But my last thing is back to the income equality very briefly. How would reporting economic statistics by income bracket benefit our understanding of the economy? We don't have that right now. 
we're actually um, doing something with that at the Fed. You know, we, we like to cut data up and, and look at it in, in new ways, and this is one of the things we're doing is, uh, is um, combining a couple of data sets that we had. We're quarterly publishing a distributional financial account. And uh, when thing, will we get that then by the next? Um, the next one comes out every quarter, mm -hmm. uh, so it's a new thing that we're doing, and it, again, it's just, a, it's just a combination of two existing data sets that we have, but we, th we think it's an interesting insight into the economy. There are a lot of different ways to look at, at uh, what's happening in the economy, and that's an important one. Thank you. Representative Herrera-Butler. Uh, thank you. Um, so. Uh, I, I apologize uh, if I have already, if some of this ground has already been covered, but it's a pleasure to be here and to have you. Um, this is the number one, I, I would say the growth and the forecast of our economy is probably the number one thing that impacts the people I serve in Southwest Washington. Um, and so it's very, it, it's, it's helpful to hear from your, pers your perspective. <clears throat> Specifically, in rural communities where unemployment is, is higher than the national average, most of my areas are rural, um, although we're, we're bumping up everywhere, um, I wanted to hear some of your biggest takeaways, uh, and I've gone through some of your testimony, again, I apologize if you're repeating, but in terms of, of um, outlook and some of the things that we've done in the most recent years with regard to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, different regulatory changes. but to either maintain the growth that we've seen um, or expand it, <clears throat> what recommendations would you give? Well, um, first, I, I think uh, the, the, the outlook is, is still a positive one. There's no reason this expansion can't continue, and there's a, there's a lot of value in continuing it, and we're trying to use our tools to, to accomplish that. Um, we're seeing this in this the 11th year of an expansion, now the longest in, in uh, U.S. recorded uh, history. Um, what we're seeing is that uh, income gains are being uh, the, are the highest at the lower level of the lower end of the wage schedule sca um, the, the scale, and um, so it's very positive. We're also seeing people being pulled back into the labor market. There's a lot to like about about this rare place of the 11th year of an expansion, and uh, um, I think um, we're certainly committed to doing what we can to to extend it. Um, in that vein, I know your testimony touched on concerns uh, with regard to the national debt. Um, it, it, could you elaborate on that and how it should be addressed, particularly as it relates to expanding or at least not contracting the economy? So I, th I think it's a, it's a longer-term issue um, that I, I, I imagine we all realize will have to be addressed over time. It's, it's just the case that now that um, the debt is growing faster than the economy than the nominal GDP. And ultimately, in the long run, that's not a sustainable place to be. Now, how to fix that, it's easy to say that, and you know, how you do that and when you do that is, is an issue that is up to you and not to us. But I would, I would be remiss in not pointing out that the consequences of not addressing it are just that we'll be spending more and more, our kids really, and grandkids, they'll be spending their tax dollars servicing debt rather than on the things they really need, as I mentioned earlier, education, health care, uh, security, all the things that, that we need, that they'll need, they'll be spending more and more of their money on, on um, tax. But you, you don't need to, to balance the budget or pay down the debt or anything like that. You just need to get the economy growing faster than the debt. And that should be, our, I think, the goal. And by the way, the successful uh, programs for countries to get back on a sustainable path tend to take place over a long period of time and be relatively gradual. And I, I would be looking at something that would work over over time, but really would not be giving you a lot of advice on how to do it. With my final uh, 30 seconds, um, do you anticipate maintaining the current uh, Fed rate through the next year? I know I wouldn't say that at all. I, what, what we said, what I've said here, and I'll go right to the actual language, is that we see the current stance of monetary policy as likely to remain appropriate as long as incoming information about the economy remains broadly consistent with our outlook of moderate growth, a strong labor market, and inflation near our symmetric 2% objective. So that's a very data-dependent mm -hmm. statement. Um, we do think monetary policy is in a, in a good place. But we're going to be watching very carefully incoming data, and if developments emerge that cause a material reassessment of the outlook, then we'll act appropriately. Context, context, context. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate it. With that, I yield back. Representative Byer. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your equanimity, your, your strong and stable leadership, and, and for providing about the most straightforward answers of anybody we talked to. Uh, yesterday at the Economic Club in New York, the President continued his criticism of the Fed, saying it had put the U.S. at a competitive disadvantage, and he also floated the idea of negative interest rates. Do you take comments from public officials into account when implementing monetary policy? And is there any precedent in U.S. history for this kind of criticism or praise from an American president? So we, we, we look exclusively at the data, uh, at, at the research, and at, at the performance of the U.S. economy. Those are the things we, we have a very careful, thoughtful process that's been developed over decades, over, over a century, really. And that's how we try to set interest rates. We don't consider uh, political factors and things like that in what we do. Thank you. I have a friend in Switzerland who went to borrow $10 million and got a negative interest rate, negative three-tenths of a percent. So they're paying him 30000 a year to borrow $10 million. Do you see any prospect for negative interest rates in the U.S. economy? Well, negative interest rates would, would certainly not be appropriate in, in the current environment. Our economy is in a strong position. We have growth. We have, uh, we have a strong consumer sector. We have uh, inflation that's a bit below target. So the very, very low uh, and even negative rates that we see around the world would not be appropriate for our economy. Those, those, you tend to see negative rates in the larger economies. Uh, at times when when growth is quite low and, and and inflation is quite low, that's just not the case here. It's different for some of the smaller European countries. It's really about keeping their currency from appreciation, which is the case with a, a number of those countries. So, yeah. From December 15th through December 2018, there's slow, consistent increases in rates, and we've turned that around with recent cuts this year. Is there enough room to cut rates further if we get another slowdown or recession? Have we, have we given up monetary policy as a tool at the moment for dealing with that? Well, um, the typical post-World uh, War II recession has involved rate cuts of close to 5 percent. The current federal funds rate is, is in the mid-150s, so we're, we're well short of that, 1.5 percent. One so, uh, I think it's it's uh, it's a fact not just in the United States but around the world that central banks are going to have less room to cut in this new normal of lower rates and low inflation. So that's why we are conducting this external review of monetary policy at the Fed. We're looking for ways to make sure that we have the tools to 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 do what what we're assigned to do by you, which is achieve maximum employment and stable prices even in downturns. Uh, and that's what we're going to be doing. I will say also, though, that fiscal policy uh, is, is often you know, part of the answer, often a big part of the answer when there's a severe downturn. And we would certainly look for that to be the case if, if needed. Thank you again by, by bringing up the challenge that the public debt uh, faces all of us here. You know, I was raised to believe that money supply and growth were causally related, that if our money supply grew more quickly than our economic outfit, that inflation was the inevitable result. But we're less than 2 percent this year. You have muted expectations. Is there no longer a connection between money supply growth and inflation? You know, I think Should we I pay any attention to modern monetary theories, for example? Well, so the, the connection between monetary aggregates and inflation, that's something we all learned in, in Econ 101. I did. Uh, it was important. It was, it was generally thought to be, and empirically, it was, a, it was a good relationship. I think about 40 years ago, as the financial system uh, developed all kinds of alternative forms of money, the relationship between monetary aggregates and growth has just gone away. And so we don't, we of course look at those aggregates, but they no longer are a driving part of the theory. It's really the, pr the, the price of money as, which, as opposed to the quantity it, that we look at, which is the interest rates. I'm out of time, but thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, you'll be. Senator Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, welcome back. Um, I want to start off by talking about China's economic growth. Maybe I should say China's economic growth, in quotes. Um, they've reported re most recently 6.5% growth. Uh, that's down from most of the last 30 years, but still probably somewhat inflated. In fact, Michael Pettis at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace says that Chinese industrialists and economists find it hard to find any economic sector in China enjoying any growth. Um, he had a few findings that I found to be quite interesting. Uh, first, GDP is not a particularly useful measure for determining Chinese growth because they have such massive investments in non-productive activities. 
Second, that China likely distorts its GDP data significantly um, in a way that's systematically pushing it higher. Uh, and then third, that increasingly GDP as reported in China is not so much a measure of economic output, but a measure of political intent, given the benchmarks that China imposes on local governments as, many, as well as many state-owned enterprises, as long as they have debt capacity and can, po can postpone the writing down of non-productive <clears throat> assets. They could essentially achieve any growth target they wanted. Um, what are your thoughts about this general question of Chinese growth and the specific points that Mr. Pettis's research had found? I think it's very hard. I certainly feel that it's very hard to understand China. You know, the, you can read all you want, you can visit it all the time, but nonetheless, it bec it's still very hard, I think, for for me anyway, to to really feel like you understand the way the economy works, the way the society works. So I think that there's a, I think you have to, um, as a general matter, just accept that it's really hard to know. I think on economic data in particular, you know, we don't, I, and I, I'm familiar with Michael Pettis and his research uh, and all that, but uh, we, we, you know, we haven't taken a view as an institution about that. I think uh, a couple of things are worth noting. One is that, you know, the, it may be that there's more information in the change than there is in the level, if you know what I mean. The other, the other is that we've noticed here in the last few years uh, that the volatility of their, uh, of their economic reports has, has declined substantially, which, which is kind of suggests a little bit more management. Nonetheless, we don't, we don't really know. The truth is we, we don't really know. We, we have to take the data, and we do take it with a bit of grain of salt. Uh, you spend, at the Federal Reserve, and there are many capable economists there, a lot of time looking at a lot of underlying indicators and statistics to try to assess the direction of our economy. When you look at not just how the Chinese leadership in the Communist Party behave, but when you look at some of those indicators, well, how their people are behaving or how other things like, say, maybe energy inputs or shipping so forth, do you see a country behaving as if they have almost 7 percent growth right now? I, it's hard to say. I, I would say that w one thing that's notable is that is that they have not responded with massive stimulus at this to this current situation. They've had obviously over a longer period of time, growth has been slowing from you know three decades of ten percent as an economy matures, and I think they're trying to manage that decline. They did put an awful lot of stimulus to work after the financial crisis, and. Um, that supported their growth. I think they, they have been much more cautious and careful. They have a deleveraging campaign, as I'm sure you know, that has been going on now for one or two years, and they haven't really backed away from that. And that's, that's part of, by the way, that, I think that is part of the global slowdown, actually, is trying to, um, trying to at least stop debt from growing inside China, where they have unusually high debt as a society for any emerging market nation. So I would say that they're behaving relatively uh, thoughtfully and responsibly in, respon in response, they appear to be, in response to this current slowdown. All right, thank you. My time has expired. Senator Hassan. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair, and uh, I appreciate your and the Vice Chair's uh, convening of this meeting. And to Chair Powell, uh, thank you for being here and for your work. Um, Mr. Powell, as you know, it is critical to the long-term safety and stability of the U.S. economy that the Federal Reserve makes data-driven decisions and remains independent from political influence. Unfortunately, recent political pressure on the Fed is having real-world economic consequences. A recent study found that markets react each time you are publicly pressured to intervene in the economy, with a quantifiable change in investors' expectations that the Fed's interest rate targets will drop. Chair Powell, can you tell the committee what actions you are taking at the Federal Reserve to not only insulate against political influence, but also to signal to investors that the Fed makes independent decisions based on sound economic analyses? Thank you. Uh, so politics plays absolutely no role in our decisions. We use the best data, the best analysis we can uh, muster. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're human and we'll make mistakes, but we won't make mistakes of character or integrity. Uh, so um, uh, I, I am familiar with that research, and I would just say it's, I think it's very hard to look at you know, our incredibly complicated financial markets and economy where many, many things are driving results and, and pull out a, 
one one or two tiny effects. There, there's other research that points to different results, but yep. I would it's it's absolutely essential that everyone understands that we are doing our jobs as we always have without regard to politics. We serve all Americans. <clears throat> we do the best we can based on our analysis. We try to be as transparent as we can. We explain ourselves, put everything we do on the record. Right. When people dissent, they put their dissent on the record. Yep. And that's as it should be. Yep. Well, I just think it's important, uh, understanding that research is complicated, that we don't complicate it further uh, with uh, political actors putting pressure on the Fed. And that has been the norm and the tradition, uh, and it's one that I hope we can return to. Um, I wanted to follow up on something that Senator Lee had talked to you about, because as a member of the Senate Finance Committee, which also has jurisdiction over trade, I'm pushing for clear strategic trade policy that provides certainty to struggling small businesses. As you and I have talked about, I've heard from businesses all across my state that have been targeted by China's unfair trade practices, including the theft of intellectual property and the forced transfer of proprietary technology. On top of these economic harms, the administration has manufactured endless trade uncertainty and heaped damaging tariffs on New Hampshire's businesses. I know you have repeatedly said, Chair Powell, that this recent trade uncertainty has created risks for the U.S. and global economies. Can you expand a bit on your previous answer on how trade uncertainty has impacted the economic <clears throat> outlook and what you view as the Fed's proper role in responding to the ongoing trade tensions with China? So we, we hear from businesses and uh, have been hearing them for a year and a half that they're you know, that this is a big issue for them and that it's holding them back from making decisions. I mean, in the first instance, businesses were, were looking at ways to rearrange their, um, their supply chains. Almost all manufacturing businesses these days have supply chains that go. So I think it's been a real distraction for management, and I think it's weighed on businesses' willingness and ability to, to, um, you know, to, to invest yeah. and, and keep growing and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the appropriate response, you know, our, our response is not to give advice on trade policy, but it is to react to whatever it is that either is either helping or hurting our ability to achieve our, our mandated goals. And so this is one of those things we call it out as something that we are um, aware of and as something that is weighing on, on business sentiment and ultimately on the economy. Well, thank you for that. And I'll just note, um, we may submit to the record that I share uh, Representative Frankel's interest and concern about um, the inflation gap. It's not just a wage gap, but the impact of inflation, uh, in particular on our working and middle-class families. And I hope that that's something we can learn more about from the Fed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Heinrich. Welcome, Chairman, and uh, thank you for coming to testify today. Um, I had a chance recently to meet with a number of European central bankers, and they really outlined for a group of us the steps that they're taking to understand and quantify and mitigate the risks uh, that climate change is uh, posing to the financial markets. So I wanted to ask you what the Fed is doing to, to understand those risks uh, and to look at their role in, uh, in the economy as we're moving forward. I just say climate change is an important issue, but it's not principally one that is uh, it is not one that is given principally to the Fed to to um, deal with, if you will. It's other other agencies have that. Um, no, it, clearly, that's the case. I, I just want to understand if we're if we're looking um, in a broad way at risk and understanding um, the data from that sort of lens. So I, th I think that is the right lens. The, the lens for us is risk management. Mm -hmm. So. We are, we're doing, there are researchers all through the Federal Reserve System who are thinking about the longer run implications of climate change for the economy, for financial institutions, uh, and for all kinds of things. And I think that's, that's appropriate research. We're just globally at the beginning of understanding that. And there's a lot of research going on, including a significant amount at the Fed. Um, I think, we, honestly, for monetary policy, it's not a current consideration. It's, it would not be something that would have any effect on the current uh, setting of, mo of monetary policy. Over time, though, for, it could, for example, affect the neutral rate of interest or the volatility of economic activity and things like that. Those are things that we're, you know, we're thinking about for the longer term. I think the public will expect us to assess any risk and use, use that assessment in the way we supervise and regulate financial institutions. Yeah. And, and also just potentially over the longer term in terms of monetary policy. Do you have an opinion on uh, <clears throat> robustness of how U.S. banks broadly are uh, analyzing that risk? 
And, and basically what I'm asking is, do we need to start thinking through whether or not we need to uh, either self-impose or, or at some point impose some sort of stress test to look at the assets that banks are holding and, and whether they're not, um, whether they don't have some concentration of risk if they're not thinking through that appropriately? The, what we're doing now is we are um, trying to make sure that financial institutions that are in regions that may be subject to severe weather have plans to, re to, to have redundant systems and, and be able to be resilient to that. That's the main thing we're doing. I think, th so the, the Bank of England, as it sounds like you're aware, is, is doing a, a stress test based on climate scenarios, but it's not the, it's, it's a stress test that's meant to be purely informative. It wouldn't do what our CCAR or our stress tests do and potentially limit distributions and that kind of thing. That's an interesting idea. We'll be monitoring it. Um, and and uh, I think we're going to benefit from some of the activity around the world that we're seeing with other central banks. We'll try to learn from what they're doing. Yeah, we're obviously already seeing some places where um, it's <clears throat> harder to turn over a house in flood prone areas. And if you had a concentration of mortgages that you were holding in, in areas like that, um, obviously that could pose a real, uh, a real financial risk. Do you think that... Um, GDP data adequately gives us a, enough of a picture about who is benefiting uh, from the economy. And I guess, in other words, should we be looking at how economic growth is being distributed across the quintiles of the economy? I think it's, it's really hard to capture <clears throat> gross domestic product in a $22 trillion economy. I think it's, uh, I think our, uh, the people who do that uh, do a great job at it, but it's quite difficult. Um, we we actually, it's interesting to try to cut the income data. So we're doing some of that now with our distributional financial accounts. Other uh, agencies are doing the same thing. I think when you have the data, we have a tendency to want to cut it up different ways and see what we learn. And so we're, we're doing that now. And I think it is informative about about the way income and wealth are shared, uh, broadly speaking, in the country. It's, it's an important perspective. We're certainly looking forward to seeing that data. Great. Thank you. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Powell, welcome. Thank you for your Senator. testimony. Uh, we are right now experiencing remarkable economic growth across the country. Uh, we have the lowest unemployment in 50 years. We have the lowest African-American unemployment ever recorded. We have the lowest Hispanic unemployment ever recorded. Uh, in your judgment, what economic policies uh, have played the most important part in, in generating that, that economic growth uh, that we're seeing right now? Well, I think um, I'd be reluctant to single out particular policies. I'll just say this, though, that uh, it's been a long, slow recovery, but it's come a long way. We're now in the 11th year. It's the longest uh, it's since we began keeping you know, credible records of the U.S. economy in the mid-1800s, the longest one, and, and we hope a significant way to go. We've just seen continued improvement, um, and uh, I think I would point to a couple of things. These, these long expansions are common now, and that really is because we conquered the high inflation. We, we, we've seen three of the four longest expansions in U.S. history have been among the last four expansions. So it's kind of become the norm to have these long ones. I think, I hope everyone takes credit for the good economy we're seeing now because it is, it is a really good place. I think it's worth noting, you know, as you mentioned, 50 year low in unemployment, wages moving up at the bottom of the scale more than anywhere else, um, growth continuing at a, at, a, at a solid pace in the 11th year of the expansion. I think it's, it's a really good time and I, I want everybody to get credit for that. Mm -hmm. Not us, but. So, I have real concerns that going into 2020 uh, that we may see a slowdown in investments as uh, those allocating capital look at the political scene and look at some of the economic proposals being put forth by Democratic candidates for president. And, and I have concerns that that may cause people to tap the brakes in terms of deploying capital uh, until at least after the election and, and finding out whether these, these policies might possibly be implemented. Um, in your judgment, what would the likely economic impact be of the federal government implementing a, a massive tax increase? Uh, Senator, I'm, 
I'm pretty reluctant to be pulled into the um, 2020 election, if you if you will forgive and me. And I certainly don't expect you to, 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 to comment on the election, but, but, but you can't comment on the economy and if, if a massive tax increase is good or bad for the economy. I, again, I'm, I, you know, I'm in, that's indirectly, we, as you started at your question, it's about proposals of candidates, and I, I just, you know, honestly don't want to get into that business, if, I, if you'll forgive me. Well, let me ask you, a number of candidates are proposing a wealth tax, uh, not just on income, but on wealth. Um, do you have any views on the economic behavior that would likely follow from a, a wealth tax scaling as high as 8% annually? It, it is really not our role to, to score or evaluate campaign proposals. And, I, you know, that's what the CBO does. That's what lots of other people do. We, we really try to stay out of that business. All right. Well, let's, let's try a, a, a different thing. Uh, former Chairman Ben Bernanke in 2014 called the shale revolution, quote, one of the most beneficial economic developments <clears throat> in the country. Do you share that assessment? And conversely, do you have concerns about the impact on the economy if the federal government were to ban fracking and shut down the shale revolution? Well, I, I would certainly agree. I think that the, um, the energy independence of the United States is something that we, people, people have been talking about for 50 years, and I never thought it would happen, and here it is. It's, it's in the nature of a miracle, it seems to me. So it's, it's a great thing, I would say. It's not to say there aren't issues to manage environmental issues, all kinds of other issues, but I think it's, uh, it's been a great thing for the country. And would it be harmful to end it? I, uh, I Economically. Would, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be looking, I wouldn't be, um, <clears throat> I think to, to shut down the shale industry, yeah, that would be, that would probably not be a good thing for the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We know you have a hard stop here in about two minutes. I wanted to use my uh, prerogative as chairman to ask one final question. We are, um, we're in the middle of uh, some pretty strong economic activity, very low unemployment, uh, uh, almost unprecedented economic stability. What policy or policies should we pursue to keep that going? <laughs> well, um, I think that the, um, if, if, if you're asking for my, my views on that, I think that the, the thing to focus on, if I were in your shoes, are the longer run issues that we face, particularly around labor force participation and growth. It's about the, the potential growth of the United States. We are seeing now how important it is and how good it is to have a long expansion with a lot of growth and how it benefits people across the income spectrum. So I, I can't overstate the importance of that. I think in the longer run, the things we need to address are labor force participation and productivity, which is closely linked to education. So I think our workers need to have the skills and aptitudes to win in a global economy. And um, those, those are the things that are going to matter for our, for our children and our grandchildren, is, is what can we do now to keep the U.S. sustainable longer-term growth rate as high as it can be going forward. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, and thanks for your service on behalf of our country. Uh, record will remain open for two weeks. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much.